Quant's Quickie from the classic Baroque music instruction on playing the flute. Chapter 6 of the use of the tongue in blowing upon the flute. Part 1. The tongue is the means by which we give animation to the execution of the notes upon the flute. It is indispensable for musical articulation and serves the same purpose as the bow stroke upon the violin. Its use so distinguishes one flute player from another that if a single piece is played in turn by several persons, the differences in their execution frequently make the work almost unrecognizable. The majority of these differences rest upon the correct or incorrect use of the tongue. It is true that much also depends on the fingers. They are necessary not only to fix the height or depth of each note and to distinguish intervals, but also to give each note its proper duration. The liveliness of the execution, however, depends less upon the fingers than upon the tongue. It is the latter which must animate the expression of the passions in pieces of every sort, whatever they may be, sublime or melancholy, gay or pleasing. Section 1 of the use of the tongue with the syllable T or D. Since some notes must be tipped firmly and others gently, it is important to remember that T is used for short, equal, lively, and quick notes. D, on the contrary, must be used when the melody is slow and even when it is gay, provided that it is still pleasing and sustained. In the adagio, D is always used, except in dotted notes, which require T. Section 1, Part 2. T, T-I, is called a tongue stroke. To make it, both sides of the tongue must be pressed firmly against the palate, the tip curved up and placed in front near the teeth so that the wind is stopped or held in check. When the note is to be produced, you draw only the tip of the tongue away from the palate, the rear part of the tongue remaining on the palate. The impact of the stopped wind is the result of this withdrawal, rather than the stroke of the tongue itself, as many mistakenly believe. Section 1, Part 3. Some have a way of placing the tongue between the lips and making the stroke by withdrawing it. This I consider wrong. It prevents a full round and masculine tone, particularly in the low register, and the tongue also must make an excessive forward or backward movement, which impedes quickness. Section 1, Part 4. To give each note its proper expression from the low register to the high, you must use the tongue just as you would use the lips and the chin. That is to say, in playing an ascending scale from the lowest note to the highest, you must place the tongue a good thumb's breadth back from the teeth, curved against the palate. For the lowest note, you must greatly enlarge the mouth, and for each higher one, make the stroke with the tongue a little further forward on the palate, and gradually compress the mouth. Continue in this fashion until you reach the highest B, where the tongue comes very close to the teeth. From the highest C on, however, the stroke must no longer be made with a curved tongue, but with a straight one between the teeth and against the lips. If you attempt the opposite method, drawing the tongue far back for the highest note or making the stroke with it between the teeth for the lowest note, you will find that the high notes sound hissing and do not speak well while the low notes become weak and thin. Section one, part five. If you wish to make the notes very short, you must use the T, since the tip of the tongue must spring back against the palate immediately in order to check the wind again. You can note this process best if without blowing, you quickly pronounce T, -t, 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 -t several times in succession. Section one, part six. For slow and sustained notes, the stroke must not be firm, hence you must use D-I-D instead of T. It should be noted that while in the T, the tongue immediately springs back against the palate, in the D, it must remain free in the middle of the mouth so that the wind is not kept from sustaining the tone. Section one, part seven. If leaps are formed by the quavers in the allegro, T, is used for them. If, however, other notes follow which ascend or descend by step, whether they are quavers, crotchets, or minims, di is used. Figure one. If strokes are placed above the crotchets, ti is kept. Figure two. If 
an appoggiatura is found next to a note, it is tipped with the same kind of tongue stroke as the preceding note, whether firm or gentle. Figure three. Figure four. It is a general rule that there must be a slight separation between the appoggiatura and the note that precedes it, particularly if both are on the same pitch, so that the appoggiatura can be heard distinctly. Hence, the tongue must spring back to the palate immediately after tipping the preceding note, thereby checking the wind, making sure the note is shorter and the appoggiatura most distinct. Section one, part nine. In quick passage work, the single tongue does not have a good effect since it makes all the notes alike and to conform with good taste, they must be a little unequal. Thus, the other two ways of using the tongue may be employed, that is tiri for dotted notes and moderately quick passage work and diddle for very quick passage work. Section one, part 10. All notes do not have to be tipped. If an arc stands above two or more, they must be slurred. Thus, you must remember that only the note on which the slur begins needs to be tipped. The others found beneath the arc are slurred to it. And the tongue, meanwhile, has nothing to do. Ordinarily, D rather than T is used for slurred notes. Figure five. If, however, a stroke stands above the note preceding the slur, both the first and the following note receive T. Figure six. If the slur begins on the second note and the unstressed note is slurred to the stressed one, play them as is to be seen in figure seven. But if this happens in a quick tempo, use T instead of D. Figure seven. Section one, part 11. If a slur is to be found over notes, which are repeated, they must be expressed by exhalation with chest action. If, however, dots also stand above such notes, the notes must be expressed much more sharply and, so to speak, articulated from the chest. Section one, part 12. It is impossible to define fully in words either the difference between TI or DI, upon which a considerable part of the expression of the passion depends, or all of the different kinds of tongue strokes. Meanwhile, individual reflection will suffice to convince everyone that, just as there are various shades of black and white, there is more than one intermediate degree between a firm and a gentle tongue stroke. Hence, you can also express T and D in diverse ways with the tongue. You simply must try to make the tongue more supple, supple enough to be able to tip the notes more firmly at one time or gently in another in accordance with their nature. This is accomplished both by the quicker or slower withdrawal of the tongue from the palate and by the stronger or weaker exhalation of the wind. Section one, part 13. In a large place which reverberates and where the listeners are at a great distance, you must in general mark the notes with the tongue with greater force and sharpness than in a small place, especially if several notes appear on the same pitch. Otherwise, they will sound as if they're produced only by exhalation from the chest. Section two, 